Hi, everybody. We're here. We did it. Another month. Let's get started. All right. Let me turn off the music here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Merge PHP uh, October. I feel like it was just September. Uh, and uh, yeah, now, now it's now it's like practically Christmas. <laughs> Is the Christmas decorations up yet? I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope you're you all are doing well. Um, and uh, welcome. And we're, we'll, let's get started here. So uh, typically, we'll go through the groups so everybody can uh, represent their various uh, PHP user groups. So let's go go through the list here. So first on the list, Atlanta PHP. Um, if you are unfamiliar with how this works, uh, everybody email Chris at Atlanta php.org um, and he's the main person that uh, coordinates the JetBrains license giveaway stuff. First person to do that gets a license. Uh, we really appreciate Chris uh, man managing that and taking care of everything there for that. Um, so there's a little bit about Atlanta PHP. Um, I, I used to live in Atlanta myself. Hopefully we got some Atlanta people. Check out Atlanta PHP. Boston PHP, um, that is Bobby and Gene. Um, and, and oh, by the way, we'll probably do a, at the end, we'll do uh, bring all the organizers up um, and kind of have a hangout uh, at the very end. So um, stay tuned for that and stick around uh, through the presentation and we'll all hang out a bit. So, uh, all right. Um, so check out Boston PHP. They do a virtual self-study group uh, about once a quarter. Um, they've got five planned for this year. Uh, Gene Babin runs that, uh, but all of the virtual self-study stuff is run through the meetup group. So make sure you join Boston PHP there on meetup and uh, you can learn some new skills. Skill up. Austin PHP, that's me, myself, and Ian. Um, and we got a lot of stuff going on at conference coming up here soon. Check out Longhorn PHP uh, for tickets. Seattle PHP, that's Tim. Um, welcome everybody from Seattle. Uh, hopefully it's not too early. Appreciate you being here. Uh, and Tim was responsible for um, the website, so definitely check out mergephp.com for our new website. PHP Vancouver, our first user group outside of the U.S. Um, I don't know if we have any Canadians joining us today, but hello from to any of the Canadians that uh, might be in the chat. PHP Vegas, that's Josh, OG programmer. Um, he goes by, and he, he also helps out with the sponsorship stuff. Um, check out his company, Remote Dev Force. Um, they, they're uh, a, a good partner and help out with the user group. So check out them. And thank you, Josh. KCPH, KCPHP user group. Um, that's Eric, John, and Dan. They, they do about two presentations or two events per month um, and big fans of the, the coffee shop um, approach. So if you're in Kansas City area um, and want to meet up and, and talk PHP, check out them on Meetup. Utah PHP, that's Mark and Derek. Mark is actually talking tonight. So thank you, Mark, for presenting. I'm thanking you already. Um, and if you're in the Utah area, uh, so I'm guessing Salt Lake City is kind of where everybody is usually based out of. Um, you'll have to tell us more about the user group, Mark, in your intro. Uh, yep. So check out Utah PHP. San Diego PHP, uh, sdphp.org. Uh, that is John and Eric. Um, they also put on a yearly... Uh, PHP Tech, and they do a lot of things for PHP, so check out 
San Diego PHP. Um, uh, welcome everyone from San Diego. And our, our newest uh, user group there, uh, uh, PHP Portland. Um, welcome Alina and everyone from Portland. Uh, they're also responsible for Cascadia PHP. So check out cascadiaphp.com uh, for tickets and details. And they're on Meetup. So definitely sign up for their Meetup group and keep in touch. Uh, oh my gosh, we actually updated this slide. Uh, thank you to whoever does this every month. <laughs> Uh, yep, this is a monthly reminder that we are nearing the support for eight, and we all feel bad for you if you're work still working on something like seven, four, or earlier. So upgrade your PHP versions and Laravel versions, probably. Uh, here's a list of a bunch of conferences coming up. Um, there's a lot happening in the, in the next month or so. Um, so if you are anywhere near one of these places, uh, check that out. Um, Austin and, and Longhorn, we are doing an online thing this year. Um, and, oh, it looks like PHP Tech is uh, um, for next year. Uh, so check out PHP Tech. Um, it looks like they've already got the dates lined up for next year. Uh, Ian, you want to say a few things about Longhorn? Sure. And one other note about tech is um, their CFP is already open. It's open until November 30th. Um, as for Longhorn, that is um, less than three weeks away. Uh, and, and we've got one a uh, day of uh, tutorials as with previous years, same venue as previous years. Tickets are still available. You got one day of tutorials, two days of main conference talks. We've got speakers from, uh, I believe, let's see, one, two, three, four, five countries across three continents. Um, so it's kind of the widest ranging uh, speaker lineup that we've ever had. And um, it should be a great time if you haven't already grabbed your ticket, whether in person or virtual. Uh, now's the time to do that. And um, yeah, thanks to the speakers and sponsors who have really made this event possible uh, for the fifth year. Now, if you're going to be at that conference or are local to the Austin area, we will have an in person Austin PHP meetup um, basically this time, three weeks from now that is free and open to the public where we will be having uh, lightning talks. So if you are in the uh, Austin area at that point on November 2nd, that Thursday, then definitely stop by uh, and hang out, whether you have a ticket to the conference or not. Yep. Thank you for the reminder on that. Yep. So uh, check out um, Austin PHP and we've got uh, an event posted for next month uh, with some details there um for the lightning talks if you're going to be there in person um there is a sign up form so check that out uh and we're on the socials uh i think the primary place is um the phpc.social uh but we have a slack and um discord user group so if you're interested in that uh definitely let us know and we can post the links in chat for you so you can be connected, get connected with the other PHP user groups. Um, yep, and so uh, next month uh, we'll, we'll be doing the what's new in PHP 8.3. I'm pretty sure this is correct. Um, and we'll have to figure out how to coordinate that with the, the uh, I think, I guess we're doing two events next month. See, I, I, that's, I'm figuring stuff out on the fly. So we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll get it sorted, um, but uh, that's what we had planned for next month. Uh, all right. So um, the talk tonight, um, as I said, uh, so architecture design patterns for PHP. I think this is something uh, crucial for all developers to to learn. Uh, design patterns are 
important and necessary thing for everyone to get a grasp of and understanding of so that you can uh, build better software. You know, maintain maintainability is, uh, I think, probably the most important thing. So, um, you know, let's, let's uh, all learn. And this is a refresher for some. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think Mark will do a good job of keeping things interesting. Um, Mark has a master's degree in, in um, something, all sorts of cybersecurity certified stuff. Uh, I, I, I think I, I, I want to learn more about all these certs that Mark has. So uh, let, let, let's stay tuned and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, it should be a good time tonight. So. Um, thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to bring Mark up here, and, and we'll get started with the presentation. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Thank you for the intro. Yeah. You're welcome. Let's get my screen share up. Okay. All Let's right. Make sure you swap over. Okay. Yep. yep. All right, um, welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna dive right into architecture design patterns. Um, this is from uh, decades of development experience, bringing in uh, patterns I find that work and patterns that don't. <laughs> and so we'll go into a ver variety of patterns and and hopefully put some terminology and, and things uh, to, to what, you, what works in development, what doesn't. Uh, Starting off the first question, though, is how do you own a marathon fast? Um, there, there's probably um, some big questions there, like what does it have to do with development? Um, so the, the, about a week ago or this last weekend, um, there was a big race in Chicago, the Chicago Marathon. Um, you had two runners here. This is Connor Mance and Clayton Young. Um, they both live and train in the valley that I live in, in Utah Valley. Um, they're both uh, elite uh, athletes representing the United States. Um, and they took uh, sixth and seventh place overall. Uh, there's a new marathon world record that was set at that race by the, the winner. Um, and these were the two top Americans. Um, so they are uh, very fast <laughs> and, and uh, are amazing runners. They're, they're really neat to watch. Uh, I, I follow them on Strava. I can see their trainings every day. Um, and uh, they are very impressive with how fast they can run and how they can maintain those speeds. Um, for perspective, my fastest marathon time is about an hour slower than theirs. So uh, they are running at about 207, 208. So they came in and, and qualified for the, the Olympics with those fast times that they got. Uh, kind of a question. So how do you run a fast marathon? They had established patterns that they follow. Uh, and this is pretty well adopted in the running world. Um, you have a day of speed work or intervals. You have tempo runs. You have long runs. And you have recovery runs. Um, and then you have a recovery day, typically. And so you follow this pattern every week and have this established pattern of running uh, with mileage being a certain target mileage and certain paces and all sorts of uh, specific things that they target for. There's also strength training that goes on. Um, to deal with the strength in the core and arms and legs. There's specific patterns for diet and fueling. Uh, it's down to a science and how you fuel for a marathon, how you hydrate during a marathon uh, how you, or any, any race, but uh, really how you prepare for this and how, how you execute on it. There's race kits. So mainly the shoes, <laughs> is the big talk about it. Uh, there's specific patterns, strategies for tapering before a race. There's certain miles you run, certain rate runs you do. Um, certain ways to kind of taper off before a marathon. There's also the physical and mental endurance aspect of it as well. And so there's all these things coming into play. Um, all these patterns, established patterns that have been found to have been proven to give you the best time. And this is how all the elite trainers, runners do it. They all follow these same patterns um, and they're all running very fast times. Um, it, it, has, it wasn't like they, they just are doing it on a whim, but they have figure these things out. And so this is how, um, in order to run a fast marathon, this is how you do it. There's specific patterns you can follow. Um, 
so the question then comes, you know, what code architectures patterns can follow to, to solve your problems? Um, just like running a marathon, which can be difficult, can take a lot of time, and takes practice and experience, um, following established patterns can help find good solutions to your problems. Um, so we'll go into uh, a handful of these patterns. Uh, we're going to cover a wide breadth. Uh, we're not going to go super deep into any of them, but you at least come out of here being familiar with the terminology. You can go dig in deeper yourself afterwards if you find a pattern that is not really clicks with you or seems really good. Um, so we'll identify those different problems, uh, good patterns for pro specific problems that you might come up on. Um, and hopefully coming out of this, you'll be able to say, you know, I want to go try using you know, the strategy pattern or I'm going to use dependency injection better or I want to use a factories or whatever pattern you decide. And hopefully you take walk away with this knowing some patterns you want to go use or try out maybe ones you haven't used before or heard of uh, or different techniques uh, for those. So that's the direction we're heading um, and where we're going. Uh, the structure here, we're going into the different classifications. So yes, there's three, technically four classifications. Uh, we're going to focus on creational patterns structural patterns, and then behavioral patterns. Um, and then what I will we'll call other patterns, um, where there's another one that's hidden in there called concurrency. Um, and then we'll talk some about some benefits of why you want to use some of these patterns. All right, so like I mentioned, there's creational, structural, behavioral, and concurrency. Um, creational deals with creating classes and objects. Structural is more uh, how you uh, builds your code, how, how it behaves. There's behavioral, um, which goes into uh, different interface patterns and abstracts. And concurrency is more low level things that we won't really get into, um, but just be aware of that it's there um, for use if, if needed. Um, so we'll go into creational patterns first. Um, generally, when I'm looking at code, if I see a new uh, instance created of a class, there's a little bit of a code smell going on there, um, unless it's in some sort of creational pattern, uh, which we'll get into what those are. Uh, so it isolates that newing up into specific places, um, which makes code testable. Uh, I love unit testing. I love integration testing and writing tests for my code. Um, and so in order to do that, these patterns really help with being able to make testable code and testable code uh, the deeper you know, testable code, the more clean it is, the more uh, solid, following good principles it is. And so following these patterns really helps with that. Um, we'll go into dependency injection first, um, and then we'll dive into the factory pattern and the singleton pattern. Uh, so I, I decided to really start with dependency injection because it's a really a key core principle in development. Um, with, with it comes uh, many benefits of code, uh, decoupling, detangling. Um, it promotes good practices and patterns, um, being able to inject uh, the code that you need um, instead of creating them in line in the middle of classes. Like I mentioned, it, it improves testability. Um, you have three techniques. So you have constructor, where a class or value is injected into the constructor. You have a setter uh, where you have a set function and it'll set a class property um, uh, so that it can be used. Uh, and then you have method where you're injecting it into method. And so here we have a code example. Um, this is a fishing pole. So one of the things I like to do, I love going fishing, um, catching trout usually. Um, and so we have an abstract class bait. And bait can be a worm or a fly or a spinner lure, which is one of my favorites. Uh, I take my kids and we often will take worms, uh, dig up in the backyard and we'll use that as our bait. So bait can look it come in many different forms. It can look like several different, you know, many different things. Uh, and you have a fishing pole. Uh, and a fishing pole, you can attach bait to it. So we have a constructor here uh, where we're doing constructor promotion. It has a public bait being passed into the constructor. Um, so that bait might come in as a worm or a fly or a lure, spinner lure in this case. Um, you can also set it. Uh, the other option is to have it be a public class property. Um, but this is another approach is to have a set function on it like this. 
especially your uh, older versions of PHP that don't have constructor promotion. Um, so set bait uh, is giving the bait in and it's setting whatever the bait is to that. So if you're running, making a test, for example, and you're mocking it, you can set the bait um, with different things. And then you have cast bait. Um, this is an example of a method injection where the, the methods, the, uh, the bait's being passed in and then used on the, the casting bait. Um, in this case, we'd go and cast with you know the bait, whatever. Um, so you can see as a, the different techniques for dependency injection uh, coming into play. This is a very common pattern uh, you will see in a lot of code in PHP. Um, the next pattern is the factory pattern, um, where you have a single class that's responsible for all the class instantiations. And typically it has the term create, um, which designates that it's a factory or the factory following the factory pattern. Uh, create a thing or just create. Um, those are established patterns that, that you'll see. Um, a couple of different techniques is a creation method um, or a static creation method. So either they're static or non-static. So the factory will have either a static function or not. I tend to have not static classes uh, for um, injection benefits or testability. Um, I don't usually have a lot of static functions in my code for that reason for testing, um, but it is a, a pattern that can be followed and, and can be successful. So a simple, super simple factory, um, really clean down. Uh, let's say you have a class that's called thing, or you know, this could be just about anything you can imagine. Um, you have a thing factory, and it just has a simple create thing and it returns a thing, and it's going to new up the thing. Uh, this factory can then be injected or used elsewhere in the code. Um, and you can know that anything, anytime you need to new up a thing, it's going to be done here. Uh, this gives you benefit of it's centralized, centrally managed. Um, you're not having newing up in the middle of your code on different places and different services or uh, different other classes. Um, the factory pattern, we also have the factory method. Um, and the abstract factory. And this example code below uh, uses both. Uh, so the factory method, you have an interface um, that uses, and it uses uh, that inheritance from there to create it. And then you have the abstract factory that produces um, things that are related using the different inputs that are there. So um, here we have an abstract class bike and you have a class road bike. Uh, so another thing I like to do is road bike. I do a lot of running and road biking. And yes, I've done a triathlon. <laughs> That's usually the next question I get. Um, so you have road bike. This is a type of bike. You might also have mountain bikes. You have gravel bikes. You have you know e-bikes. All sorts of different bikes that you could have. So we have interface interface bike factory uh, that just creates a bike. Um, the interface doesn't care what type of bike. It just needs to create a bike. Um, then we have an abstract class bike factory abstract. Uh, bike factory abstract implements bike factory interface uh, and then that class uh, the bike road bike factory is going to create a road bike um, and, and then it has the interface and an abstract related to it um, so you're going through your code you can start thinking about you know well i have all these different widgets or I have this different service or i have this different um common pattern that i'm seeing and you can consider you know how can i standardize this you know, if I have a simple interface that, I can, that these factories can implement, um, have the abstract factory and the factory method going together, um, it's a really nice solution uh, to these kind of problems. Um, next up, we have the, uh, the very debatable single pat singleton pattern. Uh, anytime you hear a singleton pattern, there's a lot of different opinions and views. Um, we'll get into that after going through explaining what it is. Um, so the singleton pattern, the intent is to ensure that only one instance exists, um, which means it has this global kind of weird state thing, which, you know, if you're in JavaScript, you want to avoid var and PHP, you want to go, generally avoid global variables. Here we're saying we're risking have global state or global classes. Um, the typical, typical patterns, you give an instance or get instant me method that is a static function. Um, and these can be, um, also used with the lazy instantiation, instantiation pattern, um, which is an example below. So you have uh, garbage needs taken out. 
And so we have a class takeout garbage extends task abstract. So it's taking just a general task. Let's say you're going to task a teenager to go take out uh, the trash. I have a couple of teenagers now, sons. And so, so I'm going to give them a little task to work on. Um, the teenager can, uh, uh, you can get the teenager here, and it's just going to call teenager get instance. And that instance is always going to return the same teenager. Um, and so this teenager is then going to be that teenager. Um, and the teenager is going to do that task. And once it's set, it's going to always be there. Um, it's not going to change. Uh, it's going to it's going to be the same one. Uh, you're going to have the same one returned every time. Um, big note on there is use it cautiously. Um, and it can easily be abused, and bugs can start showing up um, when you especially when you start having state. Uh, anytime you have state on a class, it's not a good idea to have it be a single time. Um, it's going to add behavior is going to be all over the place uh, because you have different classes trying to use the same instance of it. And so uh, don't have state on a single class. Um, it also violates the S in solid, which is single responsibility, because now classes are doing one thing and they're also taking care of their own uh, instance. And so there is a violation of solid that goes on there. And you can't easily test static functions. Um, you can technically, but you cannot easily do it. Um, this is an example of a singleton abstract. And down below, we have some service that extends singleton. And then you always just use the get instance to get an instance of it. Um, a few important notes here. You have a protected static uh, instance. So this in case will then be the, the child one because you can't do protected static static. Uh, you have a protected function constructor um, to avoid uh, being able to publicly instantiate a class. You have a public static function get instance that's going to return to static or the child concrete class um, with the no coalesce for the static instance. You have a final protected clone to avoid cloning because then if you clone it, uh, you're getting a different instance of it. And a final protected wake up uh, so that it's not serialized and then trying to unserialize it. Um, so that's kind of the core uh, functions that are needed for a singleton. Um, also, by the way, these, this code is is up on GitHub. If you look for Mark Niebergall and just patterns, there's a repo there that has all this code in there. Um, these are let's see, just a code examples to follow along with uh, giving an idea. Uh, the slides are up there as well. Um, so then we have the class, ser some service is just extends the singleton abstract. Now that service is a singleton. Um, and anytime you call this service, some service get instances, you can get the same instance back even from different classes. So um, uh, I use this. We'll get into the repository pattern later. We'll go into what a service is. Um, but uh, yeah, just avoid state where you can. So is it good? Is it bad? I'll let you decide. Uh, I know others might have strong opinions on it. I'm sure there's some uh, debates going on in the, the YouTube chat here as well. But um, I, I, use, I use a use with caution. I have seen it successfully used uh, with it being fully testable. Um, but I've also seen it go awry very quickly when uh, bad things are used with it. <laughs> so it's kind of a, you got to watch out and be careful in what you're doing. Um, moving on to structural patterns. Um, structural patterns are there to help make these design decisions easier. That's one of the biggest struggles is like, how do we build this? How do we do this? And so the intent here with the structural patterns is to lay out established patterns for uh, getting somewhere. And it's focused on uh, relationships uh, within uh, different concepts. Um, so we have an adapter and a facade. There are a handful of others, but we'll focus on these two, which are typically the most common or pot uh, that we'll see. Um, an adapter centralizes. Um, it creates a way so that you're only accessing the class or, li or uh, sorry, the framework or library in one spot. Um, so for example, you might have a REST client that's an adapter or a file system adapter um, that you might use with like fly system or the REST client that you might use with the, the guzzle client or something. Um, it translates or adapts the parameters to be, uh, to work with that different format. So think about a, an outlet plug uh, that you, or, you know, or phone adapter, char charging power cable, goes into an adapter, and the adapter is used to go from you know, USB-C or whatever uh, 
power type it is to the wall outlet. Um, and so you have these different adapters and that's what this is trying to do is taking, um, is taking the code and, and making it compatible with something else. Um, I've, my experience has been um, that when you're upgrading libraries and frameworks, it's so much easier to do if you are using the adapter pattern um, or, or facades, which we'll get into here in just a minute. Um, example here is, let's say you have a mail function, the PHP mail function, um, or maybe you're using something, some other sort of pattern. Um, so here you have a public function mail, and you get to string the to, the subject, and the message, and it just sends the mail, email. Um, that way you're not having uh, low-level mail function calls all throughout your code base. Um, a story behind the adapter, one of the first times I used it, a uh, previous, an old project I worked on was faxing, which is super high-tech, right? Um, there was a, um, a need to have uh, to change our vendor that we're using for sending out faxes. This was in the medical uh, industry, so of course they faxed. And uh, there were two different approaches. I proposed using the adapter pattern. This is what we ended up going with. Um, but the argument that you know we may end up switching vendors in the future, and that's exactly what happened. We ended up switching vendors two more times after that. And each time switching the vendor, the only thing we had to change was the adapter. It was, it was so nice. And so all your unit tests and integration tests, you just used a, you just updated adapter tests, and that was it. Rather than having to go and hunt and find track down all the places in the code where you're you know, trying to connect or, or or use that different library, because uh, the libraries were changing, their APIs were changing underneath us. By having everything with adapter, it made it for a seamless update. It was super handy, super nice. Facades are intended to work more with. Um, a complex framework. So a building on the front that has this facade that you know makes it look nice to, compared to the structure that's going on inside. And so that's where the term comes from. Um, and it works with generally more things than what an adapter would do. So let's say we take a ticketing system. So you, know, you might be using um, Jira or GitHub or GitLab or some other sort of ticketing system with, with your development projects. Um, so here we have a DTO, which is a data transfer object, and it has an ID and a title. So we have this ticket um, where we have this ID and title being passed around. And so then we have this ticketing facade. So to create a ticket between those different ticketing systems is very different. Um, from an application standpoint, we don't really care how it's done. We just need to create a ticket. And so a ticketing facade is going to go and interact with this complex ticketing system. Um, and it's going to create the ticket for us. Uh, we're going to pass in, rather than the exact parameters, we're going to pass in this data transfer object or some sort of entity we have or something like that. And it's going to take care of creating that ticket. Um, and so it, it just simplifies uh, using a you know, more complicated uh, library or framework um, versus an adapter, which is a bit more simple. Behavioral patterns. Um, so we'll dive into the strategy pattern, iterator, and observer patterns. Um, the strategy pattern, um, it, it uses interfaces, um, and there's different classes involved. There's the intent, the main intent is just encapsulating this logic um, and how you're going to implement the classes. Um, and we'll get into some code examples that really demonstrate what that means. Um, classes don't really need to know how each individual one is implemented. So kind of the classic one that we can see is a logging system. So down at the bottom, we have a queue worker. And that queue worker is, um, needs to be able to log out somewhere. And the queue worker doesn't really care how it logs. It just needs to know that it has a logger and that it logs somewhere. And so down um, there's an example, it's just gonna call log and it's gonna say starting. And it's gonna have a command that's gonna get you know, the name of the command or something. So we have an interface logger that just says you need to log and you need to have errors, um, log errors. And so then we have like a syslog and you have a DB log. So this is me writing out to database tables and the syslog is gonna be writing out to a system log, the system log for the server. And so the uh, strategy pattern just says, you know, I don't really care which one it is, just log it out. And so these different classes are implementing this interface and able to do that. Um, so this is a good pattern to watch for uh, where you're, you know, you can have one or many loggers, for example, going on here too. 
Next up, we have the iterator. Um, this is very commonly seen with collections. Uh, that's where I see it the most. Um, it hides this you know, more tricky in implementation and makes it really easy to access um, this, this set of data. Um, it uses the methods for the access rather than using trying to use array keys or array things, because things always go bad when you try to use arrays. And so here's an example of a collection abstract, um, which is another collection might extend, and it implements the iterator. Um, it has a current, it has a next, a key, a valid, a rewind, and add. And so when you are working with this collection, you can just call these methods on it rather than trying to keep track of the key all the time. Um, the, this iterator is going to keep track of the key and and, and take care of this complexity for you. Um, then you can so you can rewind, you can check to see if it's valid, you can add entities, um, you can see just one when what's the current one. So it's really clean code um, and also testable. It's mockable without having to create these large arrays. Um, and so a super helpful pattern to follow. Uh, we also have the observer pattern. Um, sometimes it's termed as publish and subscribe as well. Uh, so different frameworks or different people will take different different terminology, but they both mean the same, referring to the same thing here. Um, where you just basically have an event that notifies the observer is the general concept. Um, or something happened, you just need to notify it. Um, they, and then the observers go and do what they need to do. Um, and that's super easy and configurable usually to change the observers. Um, the application, the whatever's running, doesn't need to know what those observers are. It just needs to be able to say, hey, I did this thing. And the observer, observers can go do what they need to do. Um, so let's see, you have a file archiver uh, class, and it's going to implement the observer. Um, and then you have a file upload. So let's say the file gets uploaded. Uh, we have a public function uh, upload. I went simple, made an array instead of a collection of observers, but um, here we are trying to keep it simple, though. Uh, so you have an upload, uh, the file, once it's uploaded, uh, and the file uploader can say, hey, I, I uploaded this file. We're done. Uh, it's been uploaded. The observers in this case is going to be a file archive. So maybe it's going to go and move this file to where it needs to be. Um, maybe you have another one that's going to go and upload a file. It's going to move it off to you know storage somewhere like S3 or somewhere else they can sit for a while or it's cheaper. Or maybe it's going to um, move it somewhere else on the network. Or maybe it's going to you know delete it and whatever. The file uploader doesn't really care because it's done. And so this is what the uh, observer pattern is going to do. Uh, we'll let the, uh, the observer take care of what it needs to do. Um, then you're not having to go change the file uploader anytime you're changing what the file needs to happen after the file uploader is done or while it's processing. Getting to some other patterns. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about concurrency patterns, um, talk about the service locator or service manager and the repository pattern. Uh, I don't have any examples for this one. This is a so this is usually a little bit more lower level than we typically need to get to. Um, so there's things like thread safety, uh, transactional uh, logic here, and resource locking. Um, I have used the resource locking one uh, before. We have a lock, basically. And then you have an unlock. And so it's just uh, an approach for taking care of that. Uh, handle that correctly. So a resource can be um, a, a processing logic, or it can be data, or it can be a file, or you know, whatever the resource is getting into the uh, uh, access control systems. But um, service locator or service manager, like I mentioned, is very, very common uh, for a framework to, to have something available. Um, it's basically registry of classes, and it knows how to instantiate these things. Often the classes you'll configure it with, um, you know, say hey, this one's a, uses these factories, or you know, this factory can take care of these instantiating these classes, or you'll say these ones are following this different pattern, um, and it knows how to go and uh, take care of the the what's being injected in the constructor, it knows how to build these classes, and knows how to do these things. Um, and then you just say, hey, give me my um, service locator get, and then the class name, usually with the colon colon class uh, reference there. Um, this takes care of um, 
a lot of problems. And if you can use it alongside with the uh, factory pattern um, to, uh, and the singleton pattern to help take care of instantiation of classes. Um, if you're not using one, I highly recommend looking into one. Uh, so most frameworks come with one, so you guys have to read the docs on how your uh, framework uses it. Um, or see what you can find. Or a lot of frameworks have the component available separately, so you can also go that approach. It's a good solution. Um, repository pattern. This is one that's dear to my heart. This one I really like. This is one I use quite often. Um, and it's a abstraction layer for data. Uh, that's typically a data database, but it might be a file system, might be flat files. You know, it could be all sorts of different things. Um, you might be making external calls out to something else. You know, whatever. Um, but it only contains these data interactions, uh, and they typically have a supporting service or services and a supporting entity or entities. Um, and use abstract interfaces to help define these behaviors, uh, so you can centralize the logic in one spot. So this might be a little hard to read, it's a little small, um, but we'll, we'll dive into it and go through it. So let's say we have a repository interface, it has a public function insert, and it's going to take in an entity interface. So uh, it's just going to insert that. So this, you have a database adapter. You know, it's pretty typical. You have a DB adapter of some sort, and it can insert a record. Um, starting to put those together, you have a repository abstract um, that implements the repository interface up above. Um, it gets the database adapter in. And it has a function, insert, where it takes the entity. Um, and then it can insert. Um, the entity. So uh, the abstraction there can take care of all the inserts or updates or whatever crud you need to have happen. Um, then for a new database table, typically you'll have another repository that interacts specifically with that table. Um, you have a class uh, user entity that implements entity interface. Um, it has like a, you know, user ID, username. And it's like a hydrator or two array, you know, whatever it's got um, to help with that and then you can use it with the repository to help with the uh, hydration and um, going up the direction um, so use repository extending the repository abstract and the class user service then is then used as the intermediary layer uh, so let's say for example you're using middleware and you have these different middleware layers uh, they'll be using the user service and the user service should be the only class interacting with the repository the associated repository um, so things should be going through the user service to get to the user repository, um, where the user service is going to be, you know, might have a create that's going to call the repository insert. Um, so it's going to take care of that interaction between the, the application and the database layer, uh, the repository layer. Um, whew, that's a whole bunch. We go, we go through a whole bunch of patterns, um, but we'll dive into some of the, the benefits here. Um, these are proven patterns. These are patterns that work. They're repeatable. They allow flexibility. And long term, they reduce refactoring. Um, they lead to see uh, code that's easier to build. So it promotes these solid principles. Um, classes are doing things single responsibility unless you're using uh, singletons, like we talked about, the exception there. Um, the open close principle, where they're um, you know, open for uh, abstraction close for or close for anyways. Um, Liskov substitution, which deals with um, especially on the interfaces, we see that uh, where we're dealing with um, child parent uh, or abstracts or in versus concrete, uh, which is covariance. Um, you have the interface segregation, where you know the class should implement everything the interface does, and dependency inversion. Um, so. It, Following these patterns really promotes these solid principles and leads to better code. Um, I've also found that following these patterns, I can get very high uh, code coverage with my tests, and the code is testable. I can write tests and hit all the different code paths and make sure that the, you know everything's tested and, and tested well. Um, so these are just established patterns to get you uh, on the road to a fast uh, We'll say a fast marathon. It's like the fast marathoners have these patterns that they follow in order to get to these levels. Um, as developers, we have these patterns that we can follow to get to uh, really good, clean code solutions. Um, we won't have to jump into the discussion phase, but um, 
uh, just kind of a review. So we talked about the different classifications. We had the creational ones, we had the factory uh, the, and uh, single ten patterns that we talked about. We went into the structural patterns with the facade and um, adapter. We went to the uh, behavioral patterns uh, where we went to the interfaces and the abstracts that we're talking about. These other patterns, and we went to a bunch of the benefits there. So um, hopefully that's a good introduction to some of these patterns. Um, my name's Mark Niebergall. So I've been developing PHP for about 18 years here. Master's degree in information systems. Uh, Logan was wondering, couldn't remember what that was, but that's what it is. Um, I'm a senior software engineer and team lead working on a security, a uh, first security company. We analyze security scans. So think uh, Nessus scans um, and dozens of other of, uh, <laughs> vulnerability tools, uh, scanner tools, um, and map and a CrowdStrike and work with Mandiant and many, many others, big names there. I co organize the Utah PHP user group. I'm also a secretary for the FIG group. Um, I have the CSSLP and SSCP certifications. And I work for, I, I do volunteer work for IC Squared or IC2 now. They recently changed. They do exam development. Or I do exam development forms. So I'm reviewing their questions, updating them, adding new questions, uh, throwing out obsolete questions, those kind of things. Um, and like I've talked about, I mean, do endurance sports. Um, let's see. Uh, we, we don't have a way to do the, the questions there, but um, there's some uh, really good uh, articles uh, and, and references I used. Um, Refactoring Guru has some good design, or has good uh, patterns and uh, good descriptions of how to, what these patterns are. Uh, PHP the Right Way has some really good examples there of some of their design patterns. And, and of course, the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, um, has uh, questionable uh, sound uh, references there. So that's all I've got. Logan can't hear you if you're talking. You're muted. That helps if I unmute myself. Ah, great. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, yeah, great, great presentation, Mark. Um, if you have any questions for Mark, uh, drop them in the chat. I think we'll we'll stick around here for a few minutes uh, and give you a chance to think of some good questions. Uh, and thanks for explaining all all your different uh, uh, certs there. Um, yep. Uh, I, I uh, that, that's pretty cool that you're in the, the security side of things as well. So um, that's, that's definitely important and necessary thing that uh, we should all um, be concerned about, right? Um, so um, I, I, I guess I had a few questions, kind of maybe, maybe softball questions, I guess. But um, has there been any like new design patterns in the like last decade or so, or like did we figure all of those things out like you know pre two thousand? Yeah, I, I didn't look into the history of a lot of these. A lot of these I've been using for a while now. Um, I have seen definitely improvements in the way the frameworks implement them, though. Um, where they're definitely making some enhancements, making it easier to to use the different ones, especially like the service manager. I feel like has come a long way, super, especially recently with how they've implemented them. Um, I heavily use Laminus um, and the old Zen stuff, uh, but I've also used Symfony quite a bit. Um, so that's kind of my background there is with those, the way that those two frameworks have implemented them. Cool, cool. Um, is there, so um, like outside of the those links and stuff, like are, are there any up-to-date books or like what what's, um, like, what do you recommend just kind of like picking up a framework and just trying some different patterns out to kind of learn them? Yeah, those are, let's say those are a couple of really good references. Uh, put a plug out for a PHP architect. They do have a design patterns book that they have available. Um, I haven't read it personally, but I've heard really good reviews about it. So um, that's, that's, that's another really good resource to turn to. Um, um, user groups is also a great way to, in talking with people. Um, and a couple, the last two conferences I've gone to, which have been Longhorn and Tech, um, both had really good talks about some of the different patterns that we talked about. So those are other really good places to mix and mingle and, and, and learn about 
the, the different patterns. Good suggestions. I always like a, a, a plug there. Um, I, I think I first learned or kind of was exposed to design patterns like in Code, Code Igniter uh, and the framework seems like, you know, where you, you're like, oh, why did they build it this way? Or, you know, um, and, uh, you know, you, you kind of see, you get exposed to these design patterns and you're like, well, how can I use them to build my own software? Um, uh, so, but I mean, I don't know. I, I think people, I would hope, like, are interested in, like, understanding how the frameworks are built and, like, you know, the kind of the patterns behind and the reasons why we do things, I guess, right? Yeah. And the, the pattern, the, the frameworks, I say they do a really good job of implementing. Sometimes, sometimes you have to supplement them, is, is my experience. Um, I see a couple of questions um, coming in. Uh, I did not qualify for the Boston Marathon. I haven't run a marathon in the last couple of years, so I, I, had, I was two minutes short last time. Um, but I have recently qualified for like the New York Marathon. Um, uh, my, my fastest time was 310. The, the half marathon was 124, which was just a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. Um, are you using the patterns in standard PHP? Um, I'm usually working on single page applications. The last, actually about 15 years, I've been working on single page applications. Uh, so we have both um, API requests and long running processes, jobs and key workers. And so I've been using these patterns with both of them. Um, so I've seen them both work very successfully, um, both regular API calls and with, uh, with those uh, longer running processes. Have you seen uh, the design patterns in much in uh, in JavaScript? Um, it seems like they use some, but I uh, I know a, a lot of people are kind of like having to switch back and forth between you know front end and back end, um, and like is there are there like um, some design patterns that kind of work well everywhere? Yeah, the general principles definitely come into play everywhere. Um, I can't say my that JavaScript is my forte. <laughs> I'm generally more of a backend developer. I have done quite a bit of development done in EXTGS and React um, in the two uh, frameworks I've used, but I haven't, I can't, I can't say I can speak at a deep level on either one of them. Um, but the, definitely the principles are um, global uh, for any development language, especially the solid principles um, and testability. Um, definitely those two approaches or the concepts are important um, regardless of the language you're using. I, I wonder how like maybe the language might limit your choice on the patterns that are available to you, like Go or something that, you know, or like these different like high level languages. Um, have you done much functional programming before? Not other than just functional PHP. <laughs> okay, okay. It's been a while. I, I've done some C sharp development in the past and some C plus plus and you know dabbled in a handful of other things, but not nothing as heavily as I have with PHP. Um, cool. I think a future talk, if someone's looking for another talk, is a, a, a different language comparisons. That'd be kind of a yeah. Fun from talk to see. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we'll have to drop, uh, does anybody have the link for the speaker? If you're interested in speaking, uh, we'll, we'll drop a link in the chat and uh, we're always looking for speakers. So uh, definitely hit us up. Um, really appreciate the talk, Mark. Uh, thanks for stepping up and, and teaching us all about design patterns. Yeah, thank you. And then I'd love to have your, or have your feedback. Um, you can find me easy on PHP Social or um, just about any of the other uh, social networks. Uh, feel free to give me feedback. I'd love to see how I can do better on it. Cool. Well, should we say goodbye to chat and call it a night? <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. It's, uh, good to see everybody again. Hope you all have a good month.
Hopefully, I get to oh. see some of you Longhorn here in a few, in a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see uh, 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 some of us here soon. So, um, yep. Oh, I'm gonna add Chris so we can. I'm gonna add everybody. All right, everybody's here. We're here. <laughs> We're... Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Great talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. All right.